The de Havilland Mosquito shouldn't have worked. By every measure of conventional military thinking in 1938, Geoffrey de Havilland's proposal was absurd. A bomber built almost entirely from wood, carrying no defensive armament, relying solely on speed to survive. The Air Ministry's response was predictable. Polite rejection. Metal was the future. Wood belonged to the Great War, to biplanes and canvas, not to an air force preparing for mechanised conflict against the Third Reich. Yet de Havilland persisted, and within that persistence lay the seed of one of the war's most elegant aircraft, and the stage for an unlikely hero who would make it faster still. Britain in the late 1930s faced a grim arithmetic problem. Rearmament was accelerating, but aluminium was scarce, rationed, fought over by every branch demanding fighters and bombers. De Havilland's genius was recognising what others saw as limitation. The company had spent decades perfecting laminated wood construction, bonding birch plywood with Ecuadorian balsa and Canadian spruce using cassane glues developed for furniture. These techniques produced structures light, strong and crucially buildable by furniture makers and piano factories, skilled tradesmen locked out of metal air framework. The Mosquito would be a war machine assembled by peacetime craftsmen, a bomber that didn't steal resources from Spitfire production. The design that emerged in 1939 was audacious. Two Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, the same power plants propelling hurricanes and Spitfires, mounted on a sleek fuselage with a wingspan of 16.5 metres. No gun turrets, no bomb aimers compartment, just pilot and navigator in a cramped cockpit, betting their lives on mathematics. The performance estimates promised something extraordinary. A top speed exceeding 400 miles per hour at altitude, faster than any fighter then in service. Speed as armour, speed as weapon. The first prototype, painted training yellow, lifted off from Hatfield Aerodrome on 25th November 1940. Test pilot Geoffrey de Havilland Jr. pushed the throttles forward, and the Mosquito did something unexpected. It felt eager. By February 1941, official trials at Boscombe Down confirmed the figures weren't fantasy. At 22,000 feet, the aircraft touched 392 miles per hour and this was a prototype, heavy with test equipment, engines not yet optimised. The Air Ministry's scepticism began to crack. But speed on paper and speed in combat are different creatures. The Merlin XX engines fitted to early production, mosquitoes were rated for specific boost pressures, 14 pounds per square inch for takeoff, less for sustained crews. These limits weren't arbitrary. Rolls-Royce engineers had calculated detonation margins, bearing temperatures, piston crown stresses. Exceed those figures and you risked catastrophic failure. Shattered connecting rods, melted pistons, engines tearing themselves apart at 20,000 feet over enemy territory. The manuals were explicit, the limits were sacred. Yet by late 1942, as mosquitoes began flying deep penetration raids into Germany, crews were reporting something troubling. They were fast, yes, but not quite fast enough. The Luftwaffe's Fokker Wolf Wonder 90 and the latest Messerschmitt 109G variants were closing the gap. Interceptions were becoming uncomfortably frequent. A mosquito bounced over the Ruhr might outrun its pursuer but the margin was thinning. Pilots began returning with stories of tracer rounds passing closer, of dives that barely opened the distance, of engines screaming at emergency power that still wasn't quite emergency enough. The Mosquito had proven de Havilland's vision, but now it needed something more, something the design office hadn't anticipated and the manuals didn't permit. It needed someone willing to read between the lines of engineering tolerances to see not limits, but possibilities. It needed someone who understood that rules written in peacetime might not survive contact with war's demands. Roderick Banks wasn't supposed to change anything. 
He was a fitter, not an engineer, a distinction the Royal Air Force hierarchy took seriously in 1942. His workshop at RAF Marham in Norfolk was one of dozens scattered across Bomber Command, maintaining the Merlin engines that powered Lancasters, Halifaxes and the growing Mosquito Fleet. His job was execution, not innovation. Strip the engine, inspect the components, replace what's worn, reassemble to specification, sign the logbook, send it back to the line. The system worked because men like Banks followed instructions precisely. Except Banks had a peculiar habit. He read everything, not just the maintenance manuals, but the engineering specifications Rolls-Royce included with engine deliveries, documents most fitters ignored, dense with thermodynamic calculations and metallurgical tables. Banks studied them during meal breaks, tracing the logic behind boost limits and fuel mixture ratios. He joined Rolls-Royce's Derby factory as an apprentice in 1935, spending four years watching Merlin development before the RAF recruited him. He understood these engines at a level unusual for someone wearing a sergeant's stripes. What Banks noticed in early 1943 was a discrepancy. The Merlin manual specified maximum boost pressures, but the engineering data showed the components could theoretically withstand more. Not much more, but enough to matter. The limit wasn't about what the metal could survive, it was about what Rolls-Royce could guarantee across thousands of engines in varying conditions. A safety margin. Banks began wondering what would happen if you deliberately ate into that margin, just a little, on engines you knew were in perfect condition. The mathematics were seductive. The Merlin's power output related directly to manifold pressure, the boost forcing air and fuel into the cylinders. Increase boost by two pounds per square inch, and you gained roughly 100 horsepower. On a Mosquito, that translated to perhaps 15 additional miles per hour at altitude. The difference between a successful evasion and a very short combat career. But there was complexity beneath the simple numbers. Push too much boost through an engine and detonation becomes inevitable. The fuel-air mixture exploding prematurely, hammering pistons with shock waves that can crack metal in seconds. The Merlin used 100 octane fuel, which resisted detonation better than lower grades, but it wasn't infinite protection. Banks realised the margin depended on precise fuel mixture control. Run too lean, too much air, not enough fuel, and cylinder temperatures soared. Run too rich and you wasted the advantage. The sweet spot was narrow and it varied with altitude and throttle position. Banks started small. A single engine, scheduled for overhaul, became his laboratory. He adjusted the boost control unit, a seemingly minor recalibration, advancing the overboost cutoff by two pounds. Then he enriched the fuel mixture slightly at high power settings adding cooling through evaporation. On the test stand, the engine howled at pressures Rolls-Royce manuals classified as emergency only, sustained for minutes rather than seconds. Temperatures climbed but stayed within tolerance. Nothing shattered, nothing melted. The evidence was one thing. Convincing anyone to fit it to an operational aircraft was entirely different. RAF engineering officers lived in terror of unauthorised modifications. Every change required approval through channels that moved at bureaucratic speed. Committees reviewing committees, risk assessments filed in triplicate. Banks' modification existed in a grey area, not quite illegal, but absolutely unsanctioned. He needed an advocate, someone willing to gamble reputation on a fitter's intuition. He found one in squadron leader Peter Channer, a mosquito pilot who'd survived three tours and accumulated a healthy disrespect for official caution. Channer had flown the sortie over Cologne in February 1943, when a 109G had nearly caught him during the egress, close enough to see the German pilot's oxygen mask. 
The memory made him receptive when Banks explained what he'd discovered. Channa's response was pragmatic. If it works, it's not illegal. It's initiative. If it fails, Banks would carry the blame. They chose a Friday evening when the station engineering officer was away. Banks and two trusted riggers worked through the night, modifying the boost controls and fuel system on Channa's assigned mosquito, serial number DZ-414. By dawn, the aircraft sat on the dispersal, looking identical to every other mosquito on the squadron. Only the logbook betrayed the truth, and Banks's entry was deliberately vague. Fuel mixture optimization, Routine adjustment. The Merlin engine's boost control system was simpler than most people imagined, which made Banks's modifications both possible and dangerous. At the heart sat a barometric capsule, essentially a sealed metal bellows sensitive to atmospheric pressure. As the aircraft climbed and air pressure dropped, the capsule expanded, mechanically adjusting the throttle's maximum boost to prevent overstressing the engine in thin air. Rolls-Royce had calibrated these capsules conservatively, building in margins that assumed pilots might abuse the throttles during combat stress, that fuel quality might vary between batches, that maintenance might be imperfect. Banks's first intervention targeted that calibration. Inside the boost control unit, a spring determined how much pressure the capsule allowed before cutting power. By carefully selecting a slightly softer spring, not dramatically different, just fractionally more permissive, he shifted the maximum boost from 18 pounds per square inch to 20. Two pounds doesn't sound like revolution, but at 20,000 feet it meant the difference between 380 and 395 miles per hour. In pursuit geometry, that gap could stretch from gun range to safety in under three minutes. The fuel mixture adjustment was more delicate. The Merlin's carburetor metered fuel through a series of jets, tiny brass orifices drilled to precise diameters. Altitude and throttle position determined which jets supplied the mixture, and Rolls-Royce had sized them to run slightly lean under high power, prioritising fuel economy and reducing the risk of fouling spark plugs with excess carbon. Banks recognised this compromised cooling. When you're extracting maximum power, the extra fuel doesn't just burn, it evaporates inside the cylinder, absorbing heat that would otherwise stress the aluminium pistons. He addressed this by replacing the main jet with one a single drill size larger, increasing fuel flow by approximately 8% at full throttle. Not enough to flood the engine or waste significant fuel, but sufficient to drop exhaust gas temperatures by 40 degrees Celsius. That margin was survival, detonation, pre-ignition that destroyed engines occurred when cylinder temperatures exceeded specific thresholds. Banks was buying thermal insurance. The magneto timing received attention too. The Merlin fired its spark plugs before the piston reached the top of its compression stroke, giving the flame time to propagate through the fuel-air mixture. Rolls-Royce specified 15 degrees before top dead centre, a compromise between power and safety. Advancing the timing to 18 degrees extracted more energy from each combustion event but increased the mechanical stress on the connecting rods and crankshaft. Banks judged the Merlin's bottom end, the crankcase and bearings, could handle it provided the engine was in perfect condition. Worn bearings or slightly oval cylinders would fail catastrophically under the additional loading. This was why Banks selected which engines received modification with obsessive care. Any power plant showing even marginal wear went back to standard specification. Only Merlins fresh from overhaul with new pistons, bearings checked to within a thousandth of an inch, and compressions readings identical across all 12 cylinders received the treatment. He was pushing boundaries, not ignoring physics. The modifications broke no specific regulation because no regulation anticipated them. 
RAF maintenance doctrine assumed fitters followed manufacturer specifications exactly. The rulebook didn't say, thou shalt not adjust boost controls. It simply didn't conceive that anyone would try. Banks operated in the silence between explicit permission and explicit prohibition, that grey space where initiative lives alongside career-ending mistakes. Rolls-Royce's official position, had they known, would have been unambiguous horror. Their warranty explicitly voided if operating limits were exceeded. The company had tested engines to destruction determining those limits, recording exactly when pistons melted, when bearings seized, when crankshafts twisted. The margins existed because catastrophic failure at altitude meant dead aircrew, and dead aircrew meant liability, investigations, reputations destroyed. But Rolls-Royce wasn't flying combat sorties over the Ruhr, with Fokker Wolf fighters queuing for firing solutions. Banks was betting that brief periods at elevated boost, minutes, not hours, wouldn't trigger the failure modes Rolls-Royce feared. He was also betting on the 100 octane fuel's detonation resistance, on his own ability to select only the finest engines, on riggers who'd monitor temperatures obsessively during flight tests. The morning after Banks modified DZ-414, Peter Channer took the Mosquito up alone. Standard test flight profile, climb to 15,000 feet, level flight at cruise power, then the moment of truth. Channer advanced the throttles to the stops and watched the boost gauges climb past the red line, needles settling at 20 pounds. The Merlin's note deepened, a harder, more urgent howl. The airspeed indicator unwound past numbers Channa had never seen in level flight. The proof arrived over Gelsenkirchen on 19th of April 1943. Squadron leader Channa's crew had been tasked with a daylight reconnaissance run. Photographs of synthetic oil plants in the Ruhr Valley, the sort of mission that invited attention from every Luftwaffe controller within radar range. The Mosquito crossed the Dutch coast at 24,000 feet, cameras warm, Channa's navigator calling out landmarks through the intercom, clear skies, perfect visibility, terrible conditions for staying unnoticed. The German fighters appeared 18 minutes into enemy airspace, two Fokkerwolf 190A5s climbing hard from an airfield near Münster their BMW radial engines clawing for altitude. The controller's vectors were good. They'd positioned ahead of the Mosquito's track, cutting off the escape route back to the North Sea. Channa spotted them at six miles, two dark specks against Cumulus, turning to intercept. Standard Luftwaffe doctrine, close from above and behind, used the speed advantage from the dive, converging fire from 20mm cannons and 13mm machine guns. Channa didn't panic. He completed the camera run, letting the photographic equipment capture its images whilst the FW-190s ate the distance between them. Then he spoke quietly to his navigator. Let's see what Banks gave us. The throttles were already at maximum, but now Channa activated the override, pushing them past the stops into territory Rolls-Royce manuals marked as emergency only. The boost gauges surged to 20 pounds, then fractionally beyond. The Merlins responded with a snarl that vibrated through the airframe. The Mosquito accelerated like it had been kicked. Channa felt the increase viscerally, not the gentle building of conventional speed, but something more immediate, the airspeed indicator swept past 400 miles per hour, still climbing. The altimeter began unwinding despite the throttles being wide open. They were trading height for speed in a shallow descent that maintained energy whilst opening the gap. The lead FW-190 pilot recognized what was happening and adjusted, pushing his own aircraft into a steeper dive to maintain pursuit geometry. For 30 seconds,